Hey, uh, it's really exciting to be here. Um, COVID is something that I've been heavily involved in and, and uh, it's pretty a, a pretty serious uh, portion of my life for the last few months. So I'm excited to share some of the things that we have helped and observed, uh, mostly healthcare uh, groups in the States uh, go through. But in doing so, let me get rid of the ugly mug. First, I wanna thank Brett Hatford. He's a peer of mine that's gonna be here to answer any questions. So if you have any technical questions, we have another architect online just for that reason. So feel free to shoot away with technical questions. Uh, I wanna remind everybody kind of a timeline and how this, this impacted our lives. Uh, for me, somewhere here in about uh, early, March, I received a call from some of the Microsoft leadership. And while I, while I was involved with uh, Washington Department of Health at the time, I had no idea of what was going on at the Department of Health. And when they called, they were their systems were overwhelmed. The employees had been putting in long, long hours and their, their lives were seriously being impacted in a negative way. And I think a lot of times we think about the frontline healthcare, we think about the hospitals, we think about, but this, this uh, pandemic impacted so many people and those Department of Health were really one of the places that were strongly impacted. I'm gonna go ahead and turn off my camera so you get a little more screen here. Um, and we reduce some of the bandwidth. But, uh, and, and then as they, started getting a grip on those systems and bringing them online uh, to handle the volume that was there, the political scene was demanding more and more. They knew that testing was gonna grow. They needed more testing. The testing systems were starting in the local health jurisdictions were starting to ramp up. And so you saw nearly every state went through this cycle where they hit this phase where they were overwhelmed right here but they knew that more was coming and they had to grow. So Washington, they're processing about 20,000 tests a day. Utah, another state that I'm familiar with since I lived there, is processing about 5,000. And as the populations go up, the number of tests being processed go up. So this curve hangs true for nearly every state. And the volume of system uh, involvement just really uh, is impactful in each one of these ridges that are inside of there. I uh, really want to thank, uh, anytime I talk about it, all the people who gave their lives for that pandemic and their efforts. Uh, I was personally involved with a developer uh, who lost his life due to stress uh, during the situation. And it's much more than the front row or the hospital beds, although those are heroic, heroic efforts. We really should be thankful for all of the people along the way, whether it was industries stepping out of their industry and helping, or whether it was you know people behind the scenes that we never think of uh, that put in long hours uh, to resolve the, uh, system solutions. And lots of areas that we don't even think about were impacted by this pandemic. As I worked with the Department of Health for several states, and I know the title says Washington, but honestly, I, I worked with five states myself and my team has worked with many other states. I wanna just take kind of a, 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 a tour through the systems that we discovered. Most of the solution solutions were organized in two different stacks. You had the Microsoft.net stack, usually on SQL Server, and you have the Java stack, usually on Oracle. Uh, the integrations, BizTalk, which is a fairly legacy product, it's not really strongly supported anymore, and MuleSoft, which was a little more modern integration component inside of there. And as with all government solutions, there were just hordes of end user tools and manual processes happening in spreadsheets on people's desks. And so this kind of legacy stack of solutions legacy integrations, and then these manual processes is what these departments of health and local health jurisdictions had to take on COVID with. Uh, a couple of different places I was able to see the data flows mapped out. 
And this is not either of those. Um, I've modified this. I've taken all of their personal uh, information. I didn't want to share customer information with you. Uh, and so this is a simulation of what the of what the data flows look like in different environments. And one of the first things that I I observed as I came into their problems and we started talking about architecture is a lot of those people were accessing data right off of their transactional systems. And transactional systems really aren't meant to be reporting systems. And so that was one of the first challenges. Several of the states that had reporting problems in that curve that I shared with you, they really struggled. And part of the reason for that struggle is because they were trying to take their data out of the wrong type of system. Uh, of course, with COVID coming along, there were a lot of missing capabilities identified. And not all of them were identified at COVID. Several of the states we worked with actually already had missing capabilities that they'd targeted uh, improving before the COVID event happened. So missing capabilities really are and have been solved in a lot of those states. A lot of the local health jurisdictions are involved in those solutions. And so it, it, the missing capabilities that they're carrying along were either represented in one of these manual processes or they were a place where COVID just caused them to fail. Uh, most of the Department of Health that I worked with had four or more. I did find one state that only had three transactional systems and their list of missing capabilities was much larger than the other states. Uh, but most of them had uh, four or more uh, transactional systems and Maven being probably one of the main ones that we saw from state to state as a disease processing solution. Uh, and uh, the problem with those transactional systems is they were all fairly dated. They were all on premise on old hardware and the scalability of those solutions was really uh, unavailable at the time that COVID hit. And last, we come to all of the manual processes that we're doing. In areas of technology that have, uh, the domain is driven by professionals, a lot of times we find that the professionals are smart and capable and they just solve problems at their desk. And then those problems that they solve at their desk, whether it's in Excel or in a data science tool, uh, really at some point become a blocker because they're not wrapped up in a repeatable process, they're not deployable, and usually they're associated with one person and not with uh, system processes. And so we found that many of the manual processes in the state systems were blockers, became challenges. If a staff member moved roles, became a risk for failure, uh, it, these manual processes really should be something everybody should be working on, uh, minimizing and making sure that if they create a new one that it's short-lived and it's not a long-term process that survives in their environment. So that's kind of the data flow that we saw. What I want to do is a little more tactical than the discussion that you just had um, about what Microsoft is doing in the future. What I want to do is help you with a pattern that we used to help agencies and organizations that were being overwhelmed by the COVID data to resolve their solutions and modernize these legacy disease reporting systems that they had. So a lot of them had, as I mentioned, four or more transactional systems that uh, usually Maven was in the mix, but there were other, some were custom coded, some were other uh, solution vendor solutions that were provided in there. But we also found on many of them on premise, they had scaled by using replication. And we found some really poor practices in the fact that not only were they replicating out to a new database, but we found that they were replicating from one database to a different transactional system. And this didn't scale. This is where a lot of the systems tipped over right away. And, and so this was one of the first things that we wanted to help them with. And using today's modern patterns, we don't have to eliminate these transactional systems, but we do want to eliminate all of these extra transactions that are going on. So each time a transaction is written here, that same tra transaction is replicated and written here. 
And when you have a replication going, you know, across systems, then it's written here, then it's written here, then it's written here, and it's written here. And transactions are expensive and done on a single record. And so that system really starts to get very expensive. Then you throw it on old legacy hardware in their data center, and now you're really in a, a trouble when something like COVID comes along. The reason why they replicated from one system to another system was so that they could have a cross context view. They wanted to see how the disease reporting was relating to the trace tracking or things of that sort. And that's a great desire to have. And in data, we want you to have that access, but to do it within your transactional systems really brings a lot of risk to your environment. And, it, and the scale mechanisms are blocked at that point because you're building all of these dependencies inside of there. Another challenge they have uh, in lots of the states that we help is this is written in transactional methods or third normal form. Don't need to understand what that is, but just know it's really not meant to be reported off of. And so they would go through a denormalization process to make it so they could report off of it. And some of those systems were actually doing that inside of the transactional system. Another risk for performance and another place where they had many failures in those early ramps that we saw in that cycle. And then of course, all those manual processes were extracting and sometimes putting data back from those transactional systems. So the manual processes really became another you know, layer of risk and performance risk. As they ran reports against these transactional systems, they would cause them to not be able to handle the transactions that were coming through as the scale was ramping. So that once again, the manual processes is probably something that we want to eliminate. So there's a lot of opportunities in this architecture, and these are some of the ones that we help states with through. One of the first things we suggested is get rid of all of the replication and then replace it with a data lake and a data warehouse. So you can use these transactional systems for transactions and do your reporting in a modern data warehouse architecture. You can leave these on premise or move them to the cloud. It doesn't really matter, but you can build this in the cloud from either place. And now you can start to have all of those modern data sharing, data access and data uh, science capabilities that were needed for COVID without impacting your transactional systems. To do that, you need some cloud orchestration. You need a way to pull the data out and ingest it into the data lake. And uh, we help them with solutions around doing that process. And one of the great improvements in the system is instead of doing the replication for their scaling or the replication and that denormalization process, we were able to introduce some of the more modern cloud batch technologies like our Azure Data Warehouse that has uh, parallel processing capabilities or Apache Spark that uses clusters to do the denormalization processes. And this happens in seconds, where if I do denormalization here, I'm gonna do it row by row. It's gonna take me a very long time to cycle through 10,000 records. But this process is meant to process hundreds of thousands of records in one swoop. And so that here we get a much different result. Additionally, now denormalization is against systems that are completely abstracted from the transactional system. So they're not burdened with this process. They can just do their transactions as they were meant to be. So the local health jurisdiction can send in their reports to Maven. Maven can do all of the processing on that. And now we just extract those results into the data lake, denormalize over here. And now we can run all the reports that we want. And that's an easy place for us to do cross context because I can extract from this system and this system and this system and develop those cross context views that are needed uh, for the system to be performant and also for the epidemiologists to be able to manage and discover all of the things that they needed inside of COVID uh, processes. It leaves us with one problem when we get to here and that's those manual processes. Uh, and so uh, what we suggest and what we have helped with, in fact, Holly, my peer, is going to share one of those here in a minute for you, is that we bring low code and no code solutions in to solve those manual processes. And uh, we have two solutions that are really great in helping with that, our dynamic solution and the power, the power platform solution. Uh, Holly's going to share one that was developed uh, in the state of Washington to solve that problem. And then we just move those manual processes into their own transactional layer that's easily developed 
And now we've addressed all of those different opportunities that we saw within the state. And this puts us in a really good position. So now I have transactional systems doing transactional. I've eliminated a lot of the dependencies from system to system and all of those replications underneath. So if this system was to fail or this system was to fail and we start having a problem with this system, these systems are still operating cleanly. I'm still ingesting the data and I'm really only focused on one system where back when I had the systems all tied together, I was trying to find out which system was causing the problem. And oftentimes I was chasing ghosts through the system to get to the real root cause. So this allows us to do something called black boxing where now I can isolate the transactional system. I can address the fire within that transactional system, or I could just replace this with a new modern app that has the capacity that I need. And all I do is just now ingest the new data into the data lake, nothing in the rest of this process breaks. And so this black box boxing concept is something that a lot of the states had never thought about on these legacy systems. It's really more of a modern idea, but now they have the opportunity to black box. And the way they get there is by getting rid of all those dependencies and data flows from system to system, moving all of their data into a data lake, denormalizing to a data warehouse and doing their cross context view against that data warehouse. So if I give you kind of a listed step of the things that we did with states from Washington to, uh, to through the Midwest, I worked mostly on those regions, but my peers worked on the East Coast and the South and uh, they had you know, really the same approach and same solution to those legacy systems. Get rid of duplicated transactions anywhere you can. Only have a transaction work once. Uh, that's, that's the first thing that you wanna do. So if you're using replication in your environment, doesn't matter whether it's Microsoft or Oracle, if you're using it, that's an opportunity to, to minimize and improve your performance. So as you are looking at those systems, those legacy systems, think about that and make sure that you take future strides to get rid of replication anywhere you can. Move duplicated data uh, from on these systems where the disks are most expensive into a data lake. The data here costs about 100 times less than it does here, and I can keep it, copy it, transform it here without ever competing with those transactions. I also get that opportunity to start black boxing by using a shared data service like this to build out my data solutions instead of using the transactional system. Make sure that when you're doing things like denormalization and you're, you're using those load histories uh, that, that you use batch technologies instead of transactional technologies. If you have a, a solution vendor uh, that is in the mix and they say, oh, we'll just do it in our application, we'll just build that reporting, that is an anti-pattern. Don't let them do that for you. Build that data warehouse and use the batch patterns uh, to solve those problems. Don't do it row by row inside of those solution vendors. And it's great that they're always willing to help, but be aware that when they help you by doing transactions for reporting, uh, that that's probably in, in time going to become a performance cost and not something that you want to sustain. Uh, cross context, do it on your data warehouse and do it on your data lakes. Don't do it on transactional systems. Don't allow people to go out and try and discover uh, their data in those transactional systems. Just let them do their business. Let them deliver the capabilities that they're meant to deliver and then provide that cross context in your data warehouses and your data lake. Get all that data out of those transactional systems in your data lake and then the portions they need and need refined in your data warehouse. Uh, Black box those transactional systems. Get the dependencies broken from system to system as fast as you can. That'll allow you to replace a transactional system with a new one much easier and at a lower cost. It'll also allow you to do things to that without impacting all of the other systems downstream. So your cost and change uh, in your transactional system goes down when you black box it. And then last but not least, Get rid of those manual, uh, those manual processes and use tools, low code and no code solutions like Microsoft's Power Apps and uh, Microsoft's Dynamics to kill those manual processes. These were all lessons that we learned with a lot of the states. And uh, I would like to just turn the time over to Holly 
and let her show you one of those low-code, no-code solutions that was built for the state of Washington. Holly? So, uh, so thanks so much, Darren, for passing it over to me. Um, so my name's Holly Kelly. I am uh, an intelligence technology specialist um, for our health and life sciences industry. Um, I have been, you know, working in the healthcare space for about three years now, and um, uh, you know, this whole process started um, at the beginning of COVID. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about our em emergency response data tracking application that we were able to build. Um, and we'll go through, you know, basically kind of what the situation was, um, what the solution looked like, and then we'll, we'll actually go through and look at all the different screens so you can kind of get a sense of, of what it's all about. So just starting with the situation, um, I'm going to see if I can move this. There we go. Um, <laughs> I'm so sorry. Starting with the situation, um, so we got a, a call from Swedish Hospital. So as you know, Swedish Hospital is part of uh, Providence uh, Health System, uh, and they are located in Seattle. And so, you know, at the beginning of this whole COVID situation, um, you know, there was a lot of um, unknowns. Seattle was definitely an early hotspot um, where they were seeing a huge uptick. Uh, in COVID cases in a very short period of time. Um, and so what they quickly figured out is that most of the systems that were in place today um, that you know, manage hospital operations, like with the EMR and, and those types of applications, um, were not able to keep up with the demand of data um, that was needed uh, at that point in time. And so essentially what happened is that they created uh, this whole Excel process uh, to be able to track the data needed in more of uh, a more frequent basis than what they were getting from the EMRs and, and uh, Lawson, et cetera. And so when the application was created, um, they were looking to track, you know, much of the data that was needed to kind of get a handle on the situation around COVID. Um, so they were looking at COVID patients like positive and patient under investigations to be able to, to track where they were in the hospital. They were also worried about tracking things like available beds. So um, as you know, within COVID patients, they tend to uh, require acute care beds. Um, and so they were really worried about the capacity that they had with those ICU level beds that were um, you know, available to treat those um, intense patients with some of these respiratory respiratory diseases that were coming in. Um, the other thing that was a really big part of this was the available vents. So, um, you know, at one point they had, you know, just a ton of vents that were in use and they were, you know, very worried about, um, you know, the not having enough vents and literally having to make life and death decisions um, on who lives and who dies because they didn't have the right amount of vents and, and the right amount of beds um, to be able to handle that. Um, PPE was also a big challenge. If you remember back when this whole situation started, um, just the availability of PPE and being able to track what type of PPE, um, where it was within the hospital. Um, they used supply, uh, their supply chain was within Lawson, um, but the issue was is that Lawson was giving you know kind of that operational view, but you know they needed to track exactly where the PPE was within the hospital. So was it you know locked in cages? They were hand counting gloves and masks um, and so you know having the ability or needing the ability to, to track that PPE kind of outside of that operational system and then they were also looking at things like having to discharge long-term patients and so you know looking to see if they could offload some of those um, beds from these long-term patients and start discharging them to long-term care facilities just to free up that space for those COVID patients so the process that they built was literally in Excel, right? Excel is kind of one of those places where I feel, um, you know, people are able to bring that up very quickly, but obviously with things in Excel, it introduces a ton of challenges, right? So um, one thing was around the fragility of the Excel file itself. So if someone were to come in and move a column, insert a column, rename something, calculations broke. Um, and so, you know, the system itself was just very fragile. And, you know, there were many cases where they weren't able to get the information that they need because somebody came in and, and broke the file. Um, it was also not 
multi-user friendly. So as we all know with Excel, um, people were overwriting each other. There was no way to track the changes. And so, um, you know, again, with the, the need of that data in real time, um, they were getting inconsistent or even completely wrong results based off of kind of who entered the data last. Um, another big thing, and again, this was just kind of the whole um, uh, emergency of the situation is that they were actually storing patient data and diagnosis data in Excel. Um, we all know the, the issues with that. I think kind of people overlook some of those PHI types of concerns just to be able to kind of move fast. Um, but we did, you know, they did have patient data stored and tracked in, in Excel, which is never a great thing. Um, and then also, I mean, they were literally working with paper processes because, you know, again, these systems were just not meant to, to keep up with that. So, uh, I just, there we go. Uh, so when we started working with them, how this all came about is, so the COO of Swedish reached out to um, our Microsoft account manager. We've got a really good partnership with Providence Health System. And like I said, Swedish is a part of that. So um, the COO of, of Swedish First Hill reached out to Laura Robinson, who's our account rep for uh, Providence and said, you know, hey, we would really love to partner with you and we would really love your help to be able to solve this issue uh, that we're having, right? We've got this manual system, it's not working, we see all the issues with it and we would love to partner with you in order to get that information. And so, um, you know, I literally got this call on Friday the 13th of March um, in the afternoon. And so, um, when he reached out to us, you know, we kind of went over the system and, you know, we literally worked tirelessly um, over multiple nights, multiple weekends, you know, just to be able to partner with them um, to be able to kind of solve the issue around this manual processing. So we came up with kind of different levels of requirements, right? So one of the biggest ones was, hey, we got to take this data out of Excel. It's not meant to be there. It, it's increasing risk. You know, it's for, it's fragile, right? We got to get rid of that. So the system had to have a back end. The other thing about this is that the system had to be very easy to use because a lot of the times it was the nurses, the nurse leaders on the floors and in the, in the departments that were entering this data. So we had to have a very user friendly interface to be able to do that. One of the biggest things was that literally I think requirements were changing by the hour and i'm not even exaggerating we would get on a call in the morning and it would look like this and then something would happen during the day and then they backed up and said hey no we need it to look like this so we needed to have that agility to be able to very quickly respond to changing requirements um, the system had to be mobile and that was super critical because we needed to have the data in the hands of the people using the applications to get that information and be able to, to see it um, and manage that data um, as they were in the process rather than, you know, kind of doing something and then going back and charting it afterwards. Um, and then the other big thing is that it had to be real time. So as I mentioned, you know, a lot of these systems, and that kind of goes to this next point, which is we were not trying to replace any of the oper operational systems. And so, you know, they Swedish has Epic. Um, you know, they've got Lawson for their supply chain. We've got operational systems that do what they do and do what they do really well. The challenge with that is just some of the rigidity within those systems to be able to react in the in the time frame needed. So, you know, there were when this thing first started, a lot of the, the COVID reporting was coming out on a 12 hour basis. And again, just to be able to manage operations that just wasn't the ideal situation. Um, I think by the time within like the next couple of months, they were able to reduce that time down to three hours but again it really wasn't giving that operational view and i loved the way that the coo talked about this because he was like you know in peacetime efforts these systems work and they work great but this is not a peacetime effort this is this is literally wartime where you know in seattle they were looking to say you know are we going to have to buy or rent hotels motels to be able to house patients within these um within these off-site types of facilities you know they looked at at doing a football fields right so all these kind of things and you know there was a lot of panic behind that but just in the way that they responded to that was just really impressive and so you know just as an example um 
you know, as they were looking at bringing up these offsite facilities, um, you know, have it being able to enter that data into Epic and, and you know, track that location and, and be able to report on that location, it just couldn't happen in the time frame that they needed. So again, that agility of the system was a really big thing. So all to say is that, you know, like I said, this kind of happened very quickly. We met with the COO on Friday the 13th and, you know, I'm not going <laughs> to sugarcoat the effort because it was a lot of effort. And I was just really impressed by the way that Microsoft stepped up. Lots of people from our engineering teams. We had multiple, you know, consultants and technical sellers that kind of jumped in with this. Um, but the team that created this was um, a couple of TSPs, which were me and, and my counterpart on the Power App side. Um, and we did have some folks from the engineering team kind of, you know, helping us get this up and running really quickly. But we went from literally ideation of, hey, we have this emergency situation to having a full app into production within 12 days. So it just kind of talks around the um, agility of the tool, um, the ability to develop things quickly and to be able to respond to things in more of a real time manner. So this is really what we came up with. And so, you know, this is really meant to maximize critical resources. So again, um, being able to track where patients are, um, you know, having this kind of mobile application that nurses can use. And I'll, I'll get into some of these screenshots in a little bit more detail. Um, but, you know, we were instantly able to report on, you know, how many patients were we seeing? Um, you know, what's my available of beds in my acute units? Do I need to retrofit a PICU into an adult ICU to be able to handle those types of patients and track those types of patients? The other thing was also around staffing. Um, so one of the things they were really worried about is nurses catching COVID because of the lack of PPE um, and really just not having enough staff to be able to have um, you know a, a decent nurse to bed ratio to be able to treat those patients right having a bed is one thing but not having the staff to treat them was a whole other issue um, and then you know things like PPE where it was at the vents etc um, one of the big things was around data um, so they wanted to use a little bit more data driven approach to this um, you know and again kind of making those decisions in real time um, so, you know, obviously we have the mobile app that was able to track the data, um, but on the other side of things, we developed a Power BI dashboard for all of their decision makers. And so um, uh, Kevin, who was the COO, was nice enough to um, invite my counterpart and I to one of their morning huddles where they literally used this Power BI dashboard to drive that huddle process. And so they, you know, they were looking at this data in real time, the, the data was constantly being updated. So it was just really encouraging to see, um, you know, something that was developed so quickly and literally seeing its impact um, within two weeks time of they were using this app um, as part of the stand up. Um, you know, again, this kind of goes to that same uh, that same component, which is, you know, making better decisions faster, data driving, um, having the data in real time. And then I'll talk a little bit about this administration console as well, because one of the things, like I said, that we that we really needed to focus on was the agility of that system. And so being able to very easily add locations or reclassify locations from, you know, a, a different acuities, things like that. Um, was super important. Um, another interesting thing that came out of this is that, you know, we started from more of a hospital perspective where we were looking at the data that was coming in specifically for Swedish. Um, what we quickly realized was the value of this in that many other healthcare organizations were struggling with the same type of, of issue is that, you know, this, the situation was evolving so rapidly um, that it was really difficult to get uh, the information in a timely manner. The other thing that also came out of this is that, you know, the data requirements that were coming out at a state level as well as a federal level within the CDC. Um, and so what a lot of hospitals were doing is when we first started this, there were no data requirements from the CDC that, that were required to be reported. But what we quickly found out is as those CDC requirements came out, we were capturing 90% of that data. The only thing we weren't capturing was the mortality. Um, and so it was very easy for Swedish to be able to just, you know, publish out these data extracts from that system and provide that 
uh, to the CDC. We also worked with the Northwest Health System uh, or healthcare network, um, which is kind of a, a consortium of multiple different um, hospital systems, but it's driven at the state level um, to be able to roll this data up very easily to a state level. So we have regional level dashboards, we had facility level dashboards, we had hospital system level dashboards. Um, and then again, that kind of rolled up to um, different levels of dashboards throughout um, throughout the region. And a lot of that just had to do with the standardization of the data definitions and how the data was being captured. So this is, I'm just going to go through these screens really quickly, just in the interest of time. Um, but this is really what the app looked like. And so, you know, as nurses were able to log in, um, you were able to, ch to choose the hospital system, what location you were at. And again, all of this was reading from a back end um, a back-end a data store. So the data store that we ended up using for this was something called uh, Common Data Service or CDS, um, which you know has direct ties into making these um, power apps, low-code, no-code types of applications very quickly um, because it kind of understands those data structures and, and power apps can start generating things like model-driven applications for some of the administration pieces where we didn't have to worry about building all of that plumbing in. We were just able to leverage the common data service that had all of those built-in components and, and react very easily. So, you know, the, all of this was data-driven. So you could have like the hospital system, you could have different locations, you could have different facilities. Um, and then basically through each one of these screens, you were able to um, enter the data based off of the structure that was defined within the CDS. So, um, you know, we had different locations, how many patients, um, you know, did we need to, um, suggest that we have nurse partners that are filling some of the gaps that maybe our staff nurses, um, you know, weren't able to cover. So, you know, how do we request um, different uh, resources for that? Uh, tracking the equipment in use. So we started out with just vents, but then very quickly, um, the Papper suits that had the, you know, kind of the the outbreak type of white uh, white gowns that that are pretty heavy duty. We needed to track those as well. Um, so supplies, like I said, um, a lot of their supply chain was coming from Lassen, um, but we really needed to track more in real time where and how much um, supplies we had on hand. Um, you know, staffing needs. So you know, if a department was running out of resources, they could request a nurse or a nurse partner from another. Um, from another department, um, we were able to track uh, COVID statistics. So you see here, um, you know, we have the areas here, and so you could track the patient under investigation, positive, um, in just a really easy way. And it's, and it's a very common um, interface that many people who are using any sort of mobile application are going to be very familiar with this. Um, discharge planning. So again, this was kind of looking at uh, the long stay patients and, you know, how many beds we could free up. So, you know, if we had um, 12 patients that were ready to be discharged, um, but we had, you know, discharge barriers. So was it a guardianship issue? Was it, you know, not having the right medical equipment at the, um, at the, at the facility that we would be discharging to. And then they could see how many discharges we had in the past 24 hours and then how many likely. Um, and then the nurses, of course, could then end shift. So, you know, as these, as this data was being entered, it was tagged by a particular user ID of who was entering it. So we were actually able to keep um, folks accountable for keeping that data up to date because we could actually see when the data was updated, who it was updated by. Um, and so everything was tagged to uh, a user ID. Um, we also added in the app feedback button. So, you know, if something wasn't working, we were, again, we're able to react very quickly with that. Um, and then of course, you know, switching facilities um, was very easy to do as well. Um, so this is the dashboard that was created. So again, this is in Power BI. Um, and, you know, again, just being able to get the uh, information around the beds, the staff, uh, this was all uh, reportable by Acuity. So I mentioned, you know, those acute locations were the ones that they were concerned about. And so, um, you know, being able to see how many available beds do I have within my ICU? But then if I have those available beds in my ICU, how many nurses or how many, um, you know, how many uh, nurse requests do I need to put in to be able to staff those beds? 
um, the discharges, equipment, you know, we could see uh, supplies on hand. So this was the Power BI dashboard. And then within each one of these, so I could actually go into, I just don't have a screenshot of this, into the facility details, and I could see all of this information by location. So I could see in, you know, 9E, what was my, what, what does my COVID footprint look like? and kind of see that in a single view. So I could get a view at my hospital. I could also aggregate by department, by acuity, all these other things. And then within, behind each one of these, we were able to give um, trending information. So when you clicked on bed management, it would go to a bed management dashboard and you could see how that was trending over time. Um, we had some you know, color coding within, you know, to give indication if, if something needed to be uh, looked at. So just the level of detail that they, were that they were able to get within this dashboard was really, really helpful um, in the midst of that situation because again, they could kind of get that um, leading indicator, if you will, about, you know, were we running low on a particular resource and then how could I react to that? We also had some of the dashboard components and I would call this not really a dashboard. It's really more of a histogram of data, but in the admin console, you could go in and actually see um, some basic information. So for instance, um, you know, with uh, organizations that maybe didn't have Power BI or, you know, something like that, then they could use these simplistic dashboards, but it just wasn't at the richness that you would get with Power BI. Um, and then again, so this was the, this is the admin interface. And like I said, this is all built into CDS in Power Apps, whereas you could have um, you know, nurse admins coming in here or hospital admins and literally defining locations and then relationships to, um, you know, different departments or acuities or whatever that might be. So the data structure was, was defined within the CDS, but then the management of that, this was just generated out of that model um, to be able to manage the data. So I didn't have to go and build like an administration application or I didn't have people, you know, inserting data into a SQL database. This was all happening uh, with CDS. So again, data that we were tracking, like regions, locations, facilities, departments, we had acuities, so you could set different acute um, care facilities, uh, supplies, staffing needs, and then roles. So when we did the initial development, this was all done within Swedish. Um, and as we kind of completed that with Swedish, it was getting rolled out to many of the Providence um, health uh, system uh, regions as well. Uh, we worked with a ton of other health systems across the state of Washington. And this really helped with the, uh, the regional facility or the, the, the regional reporting, because again, all the data structures were the same. We had a common taxonomy. So being able to um, take that data, create the aggregated view at the region levels um, was very easy to do. I, well, I won't say easy, but it was a lot easier than it would have been. Um, and then, you know, we did work with a lot of other hospitals to be able to onboard that. So this was created so, um, template app. Um, so, yep, I'm done. Um, yeah, no, uh, the one thing that, that I'm not sure you're aware of that happened on the backside of this, but at the same time, the state was trying to manage the PPNE delivery, and we were having as much trouble at the state level trying to figure out where things were at. And when you rolled this out, we yep. were able to bring the data from that common data model uh, into a, a, a similar solution that was developed over on the National Guard side, who was, you know, aiding with delivering the PP&E around the state. And so this solution extended well beyond these people. It helped us over on the state side. And uh, it also led to several other similar solutions being designed in a similar time to fill out some of those other manual processes that were problematic during COVID. Yeah. There were four at the state that were built. Yes. So, um, so yeah, so, you know, like I said, I mean, this was all kind of the brainchild of the Swedish COO, but, you know, just really smart guy, really passionate. And then as Darren had mentioned, um, it, I mean, it was so applicable at the time to many different other hospitals, different industries, different roll-ups, um, and just having that, that common data structure um, behind that was, was really critical. Um, so the other, the, the other one thing as well is that I don't have the link to that, but I can, I can provide that, um, is that we did create this as a, as a template app. 
So, you know, anyone who wanted to use this app, use the dashboard, could literally just download it from Microsoft.com for free, um, set it up within their environment. I think the install and configuration time was like an hour, maybe two. Um, and so people were able to use this, get this up and running quickly. So we've got a pretty large constituency of hospitals now uh, that are using the app. So that's all I had to so Darren, I'll uh, pass it back to you if there's any questions or Ron, if you wanna take over. Sure, maybe, uh, did you have something, Darren? I just, I think that's such a great example of how, you know, COVID exposed these needed processes that were there and you know with, through the thoughts and efforts of, of people they were able to solve it quickly with the no code low code tools that opportunity is still there for all of those user processes that are still setting in excel in your environments today 